first time. I do want to make sure that everybody remembers, I don't know how some of us could forget this, but next week is spring break. We usually whoop at this point, if anyone would care to join me in that. Um, is CSU's, is that spring break for CSU too? No, it's this week. First. Oh, it's this week. Oh, don't whoop, man. It's, oh, it's fading away. Even as you <laughs> so how kind of you to come here. On that. Uh, so there will be no session next Tuesday, but we'll be back here on April 2nd with Kirby Wynn from the Garfield County uh, staff, who is the oil and gas liaison for that county doing some comparisons of Garfield County and Boulder County. So April 2nd, we're back here. And then we will have the week off uh, after that, because that's the Conference on World Affairs, and we are not goofy enough to try to compete with the Conference on World Affairs. So it would be the jazz concert. Can you imagine if we were dumb enough to compete with it? <laughs> oh, what a thing to do to a speaker. That would be terrible. So uh, we will not do that. Um, our program, we're going to stick because I have been so pleased with being able to include and respond to, I believe, every question. Uh, I grouped them and I may swoosh out some of the, the subtle distinctions between them, but I'm really enjoying the fact that I leave with Estonia covered and other matters that have been of interest. So, so we're going to stick with that. Uh, we're going to change format a little bit that half an hour while the speaker is continuing, Senate of the American West people will be just quietly, wraith-likely uh, walking around there and, and you can signal them and get the cards and then they will bring cards to me so I can do a little bit of sorting before uh, the speaker concludes. I will say that one of the great pleasures of our grant, our National Science Foundation grant, is that we are finally taking me out of empty rhetoric and hypocrisy because I must have said a thousand times since 1984 that we should work more with CSU. We should have more of a partnership with CSU and if I had a dollar for every time I'd said that and done nothing in response to that, I would have endowed the Southern American West for uh, decades to come. But now those empty declarations are really materialized and, and acted on uh, with Reagan Wascom and with our speaker tonight. So I also uh, think that tonight is a particularly important topic. Well, all of them are important topics, but the way in which the issues of fracking and regulation of fracking and citizen concern over fracking get us to really the central issue of, of um, United States governance. Federalism, the role of federal government, state government, uh, county, municipality, the dynamic relationship among them, the fact that we settle it down for, I don't know what, minute and a half and then it goes dynamic again. So this, uh, this talk tonight takes us not only into a really important area of fracking, but also into a really important area for the nation in its present and future and past. Uh, how and where citizens engage with government and what level of government is the one that they turn to and how those levels interact is really what we're here for tonight. Our speaker, we're very fortunate that we heard that uh, uh, Charles Davis at the political science department, a professor in the political science department at CSU had given a talk on the politics of fracking that had been very illuminating on this matter of jurisdictions and the, the uh, tensions on our thinking about that that fracking has produced. So we were happy to hear that he was giving that talk and then we were about 100 times happier when he agreed to come give it here. And so we were very happy to have him here. He has, uh, his research interests are in energy and public lands policy making and that's a, another virtue of tonight is that he'll take us in the direction of some public land issues as well as, as private land development. And he is, uh, teaches courses that we all would be so much better off if we had taken U.S. environmental politics and policy, theories of the policy process, environmental policy administration, regulation in the public sector, and introduction to state and local government. And I wish I had been a fortunate CSU student to take those. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Charles Davis. I feel sort of compelled to uh, start out with a, with a definition. I, I suspect that everybody in the room probably already knows it, but uh, fracking is um, a technological innovation that's been around for 50, 60 years. Uh, but uh, what really got it going as a political issue was the marriage between hydraulic fracking, which is largely a vertical process that was used historically for um, getting secondary tertiary recovery from uh, oil and gas wells to a greater extent. 
then all of a sudden now we, we begin to see the uh, advantages of um, horizontal drilling, which was perfected in the Gulf of Mexico. Of course, we're all familiar with the BP spell, and, uh, but the technology is largely the same, whether it's onshore or offshore. And uh, so consequently, it's only been within the last five years that uh, it's taken off politically as a major policy issue. So there's a, a rig. And the benefits of fracking and, the, and, and some of the disadvantages of fracking, I'll, I'll just mention those very briefly, and then we'll go into the, the meat and potatoes of, of how the political process works. Um, the general benefit uh, always begins with energy independence. And so the argument is that uh, according to Energy Information Administration, which is the, the major um, repository of information about uh, energy in the United States, it's a, it's, a, it's a unit within the Department of Energy, and uh, one of the really nice things they do, by the way, if you, you haven't gone into their little data set, is that they provide uh, state profiles. And the state profiles uh, provide us with a nice overview of what energy sources contribute what to our energy mix within the state and how it's changed over time. Uh, another thing that uh, fracking supposedly does is that uh, in addition to the uh, international implications, uh, geopolitics of energy, uh, we're less dependent upon countries as far as the importation of, of, of energy that we used to be. Um, of course, it's uh, primarily, a, 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 it's largely a jobs issue for many people, uh, particularly in the uh, Midwest, Northeastern United States. Um, and during the early years of fracking as a policy issue, I think probably the one thing that really stood out uh, was that uh, we were still talking about climate change politics in 2009, 2010. So one of the context that you begin to see uh, fracking discussed was largely that natural gas is a bridge fuel. Okay, so um, yes, it's a fossil fuel. Yes, it still produces greenhouse gases, but uh, it's 50% cleaner than coal as an energy source. So we're still better off, uh, even if we think of uh, natural gas as a bridge fuel to that greater uh, future when we rely largely on renewable energy resources as a means to generate electricity in the United States. Uh, problems with fracking, um, early on uh, gas land became kind of a, a catalyst for awareness of fracking as a policy issue. And really one of the, the subtexts to this talk tonight is um, how you perceive fracking as a policy issue. I'll get into that in just a second, but, but the short answer is, um, is it an energy issue or is it an environmental protection issue? Um, early on, uh, in gas land, uh, you saw some um, memorable sites, such as uh, uh, a faucet you know, catching fire because of a burst of methane coming and, and so uh, that really affected a lot of people in terms of how they perceived uh, fracking as a policy issue. Secondly, it has major impacts on local government infrastructure. So um, for many people, it's a quality of life issue. So you see these big, uh, what they call thumper trucks that um, uh, deliver fracking chemicals and sand and water to the, the drilling site. And um, creates a lot of noise, it creates a, a lot of damage on local roads, and it, great uh, repair bills are enormous. And uh, in addition to that, there's uh, aesthetic concerns and um, traffic. Thirdly, uh, and we're getting to see this a lot more in states like Pennsylvania and New York. Um, in New York, uh, the governor of New York is um, somebody who hasn't it's successfully delayed the implementation of any sort of fracking policy or regs. And the argument is that we don't really know enough about the environmental impacts. 
So uh, one of the things that's going on right now, and a lot of other states, including Colorado, are paying attention to it, is that uh, there are major health implications to fracking that are not well known, not well understood. It's not been funded area of research. The University of Pennsylvania is one of those institutions that's uh, beginning to carry on a major study. Okay, fracking politics 101. Um, my argument is that uh, uh, there are three major aspects to fracking politics that are particularly important. And they interrelate substantially. One is federalism. Who makes the key decisions? Is it the feds? Is it EPA? Is it the state government? Uh, to what extent should local governments be empowered to make ordinances or regulations pertaining to um, fracking operations in or near their city? Um, obviously, Longmont and Boulder have had substantial experience with that, and Fort Collins is about to do the same. <laughs> with, of course, the threat impending over our heads of um, likely litigation from the Colorado Oil and Gas Association and probably COGCC, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, which is the primary regulatory authority in the state of Colorado for oil and gas drilling. Um, so the, th the other major issue is what I just mentioned two seconds ago, and that is, is fracking perceived as an energy issue or is it an environmental protection issue? So those three things. Uh, there are two conditioning factors as well. Uh, when you talk about energy frames, one of the, the things that uh, largely affects whether or not containment is a successful political strategy for oil and gas companies that are trying to prevent any sort of controversy from emerging uh, depends largely on whether or not there are any focusing events, any oil and gas accidental spills, any flare-ups. Sometimes it doesn't even matter whether it's necessarily related to oil to uh, fracking. Um, if you have any kind of an oil or a gas spell, that raises public awareness of some of the risks. And it's about perception of risk as much as anything else. Uh, another thing that is quite important at the local level, and I'll get into this, some of the intergovernmental distinctions uh, very shortly, is that um, sometimes local governments are largely similar when you're looking at demographic characteristics or um, population size, level of education, level of environmental concern. Many of the front range communities are like that. But what differentiates a Longmont or a Fort Collins or a Loveland from other front range communities uh, lies in the political activity of local environmental groups, entrepreneurial activities undertaken by these local groups and by particular individuals. In the city of Fort Collins, for example, you not only have a local group, you know, FRAC Fort Collins, but you also have political entrepreneurs that have been uh, voicing um, arguments on behalf of environmental protection for a very long time, like Kelly Olson, who's a city council member of Fort Collins. Fracking is a national political issue. It really started with uh, the notion that uh, with this new technology, we have a 100-year guaranteed supply of natural gas in the United States. There are disagreements about that. Those are assumptions that were made by the um, geologists and others at uh, EIA, the Energy Information Administration. Since then, competing estimates by the uh, US Geological Survey and others have, have uh, indicated that uh, there's a range of guesstimates about our supply. Uh, secondly, um, one of the major issues that occurred in the mid-2000s that represents the interplay between Congress, political party, is the decision to exempt fracking from the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that was a, that was a big, um, basically this was part of the Bush administration energy policy strategy. Uh, early on, 
when uh, Bush and Cheney uh, entered office in 2001, uh, Vice President Cheney assumed control of a task force on energy policy within the United States. And the policy goal was very clear. Um, we were to try and achieve energy independence to a greater extent by uh, maxing out to the fullest extent possible on domestic energy production. So that meant more coal in Appalachia, it meant uh, uh, re removing barriers, technological, political, economic, to the development of gas resources. And one of those barriers was perceived to be regulatory. If we could um, unleash the power of oil and gas companies to do more drilling, to obtain more gas, then this would greatly accelerate the U.S. on its um, path to energy independence. Thirdly, you had um, the nationalization of the issue, in part by uh, the popularity, um, notoriety, depending on how you look at it, of gas land. Um, you had other documentaries. There was one by Dan Rather Reports, which was actually quite illuminating in many respects. Um, uh, Gasland, as you probably know, was nominated um, for an Academy Award as a documentary. Um, but uh, the, the subtext of this, the summary of it, largely suggested that uh, groundwater contamination was an unfortunate byproduct of fracking operations. And finally, uh, you had a lot of in major increase in media coverage of fracking from 2009 to 2011. Let's see, I'm going to go to that table real quick. Um, I did a content analysis a year or two ago, and uh, um, if you look at the top line in 2009, 2010, 2011, you can see the jump in, in simply the number of stories uh, in three regional newspapers, uh, the Houston Chronicle, the Denver Post, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, it's also interesting to look at stories that mention a federal, uh, a more prominent role for EPA as a policy actor. Uh, notice the Philadelphia Inquirer going from 0 to 8 to 15, but the Houston Chronicle going from 1 to uh, 10 to 24, and even the Denver Post. So if I go back. Okay, so if we look at federalism more closely, um, in terms of folks that argue the feds have a, a larger role to play in uh, developing public policy toward fracking, um, the major players include a couple of people from Colorado, Congresswoman um, Diana DeGette. Uh, since 2009, um, Jared Polis, of course, is a major policy actor on this front. Uh, and uh, uh, Maurice Frenchy from uh, New York State. Uh, have introduced annually something called the Frack Act. And, and the purpose of the Frack Act is to uh, undo what happened in 2005 with the Energy Policy Act. And that is to remove that exemption from um, the Safe Drinking Water Act. And, and to argue that uh, really uh, one good way to allay fears about uh, fracking as a as an environmental policy issue is to um, make oil and gas companies subject to the same laws as other businesses in the United States. Secondly, another major uh, policy actor does not have that exemption, and that is the U.S. Bureau of Land Management in the Department of Interior. So if you look at uh, energy leasing on public lands, that's a major source of energy production in the U.S. and for the last 30 years or so um, the major means of uh, obtaining oil and gas from the public lands has been through fracking. Uh, they're in the process right now of updating um, the fracking rule for the Bureau of Land Management and it's quite likely that they're going to focus on, on three things. One is um, uh, disclosure. Um, the latest word is that uh, they're going to adopt uh, frac focus as the primary uh, source of information in terms of um, disclosure about chemical policies. This is an industry-sponsored uh, source of information from the American Petroleum Institute. 
Um, many states have adopted that as their fallback strategy, and it uh, looks like BLM is going to do the same. But in addition to that, BLM is going to uh, develop a plan for the disposal of flowback waters. Uh, Secretary Salazar, before he leaves office, has indicated that one of his uh, primary goals is to ensure that the issue of flowback waters is dealt with. Um, thirdly, uh, EPA is involved in a couple of ways. One is that uh, they're undertaking a major study that was begun in 2010. The purpose of the study is to examine the risks associated with fracking. This would be um, basically time two. <laughs> in 2004, EPA did uh, a study of fracking that was very narrowly designed as a study. And um, it didn't really focus on um, environmental risks associated with fracking. And it was also done uh, within the context of coal bed methane, which is a different type of fracking than fracking today, which occurs with uh, shale. Shale is located much deeper underground, usually um, 5,000 plus feet. Um, coal bed methane is located closer to the surface and much closer to groundwater, by the way. So uh, EPA will be conducting this study and one of the concerns that oil and gas companies have is that this is a pretext to uh, substantial or additional regulatory authority to be um, taken by EPA. Uh, those who favor state government are more likely to be Republicans. Uh, they're more likely to believe that uh, EPA should not have regulatory authority over fracking. They strongly favor retention of primary regulatory authority at the state level. And, and, and when Mitt Romney was running for president, he echoed the beliefs that, may, that are shared by many uh, Republicans, governors, um, members of Congress, including Doug Lamborn, who's the uh, subcommittee chair and House of Representatives for Public Lands, that uh, basically states are in the best position to regulate fracking, including public lands. So for them, it's simply redundant to have an extra layer of regulation superimposed upon uh, regulation that's already being enforced through a memorandum of an agreement between BLM and COGCC, for example. Thirdly, congressional Republicans also favor restrictions on EPA's uh, regulatory authority under the Clean Air Act. And one of the ways that they're regulating fracking right now, if you look at fracking as the entire drilling operation, not just the technical definition of fracking, which is uh, trying to extract gas from a shale formation. One of the ways in which um, clean air is being regulated by EPA under fracking is trying to ensure that uh, leaks from compressors and from pipelines that are associated with getting the gas from the wells to the public um, are minimized. There's less flaring, there's less waste, and so one of the things that EPA did uh, last year was to require uh, a greening regulation of sorts. That is to say that um, to tighten uh, regulations in such a way that uh, uh, companies would actually recoup their investment, as EPA put it, by um, recapturing a lot of the, the the gas that is escaping into the atmosphere and creating uh, environmental problems. Okay, this is, <clears throat> I looked at that. I uh, also did a, uh, if we want to look at individual characteristics, getting back to political party and issue framing, demographic characteristics um, don't tell us a whole lot so far. I've got a separate study going on right now for a conference next week. Um, my goal for the rest of this week is to write that paper. But I've already done some, some analyses. I, I got a, a, a survey from the University of Texas uh, on energy policy. And uh, I've analyzed the data. 
It tells me a lot of the same things that this does. This is from the Texas A&M. They're both national surveys. Um, gender is slightly associated with uh, attitudes toward fracking. Women are slightly more likely than men to um, have concerns about the environmental risks associated with fracking. Um, the, the, the most important variables by far are ideology and political party. And you can see from this that uh, uh, going from the liberal to the uh, conservative, that uh, the mean values here are quite significant. The same is true for uh, political party identification. Democrats and liberals are much more likely to um, oppose fracking operations. Okay, so state regulation of natural gas, getting down to the state level. Um, the story here is kind of interesting. Um, oil and gas has been regulated by the states since the 1930s. It gets back to an interstate compact commission. Uh, interstate compacts are an institutional device for making decisions that regulate what states do. The reason they were adopted in the first place was because of a fear that oil and gas companies had about federal regulation. So the idea behind an interstate compact is to develop a set of policies that will be binding on state participants within that compact and for them, this is preferable to subjecting themselves to regulation by a higher federal authority, including somebody like EPA, who obviously didn't exist during the 1930s. So the upshot of all of this is that uh, state regulation of oil and gas has been going on for a very long time. Um, what you have here is a kind of structural bias in favor of energy development in relation to environmental protection. The reason I say that is because if you look at the uh, mission statements of a majority of oil and gas regulatory authorities at the state level, you see the orderly development of oil and gas resources. You don't see um, protecting the air or water, uh, although Colorado did amend their statute um, in the 1990s to add environmental protection. Uh, in addition to that, oil and gas is usually separated from other departments, like uh, Department of Environmental Protection or Department of Energy. They usually have standalone regulatory authority. And finally, it is not unusual for states to have requirements that restrict membership on the regulatory commission to people with industry experience. And so on the one hand, you can say, well, this guarantees that there will be expertise in energy uh, represented on the commission. The other side of the coin, of course, is that maybe they're less sensitive to competing points of view, such as environmental protection. State versus local. This is what I've been working on most recently. And this is something that's very interesting to me because, um, first of all, uh, should state officials retain regulatory authority at the expense of local land use authority? And I, I'm sure this is something that's um, quite important to many people in this audience, as well as many people in Fort Collins these days. Um, the answer is, from the perspective of COGCC and Governor Hickenlooper, uh, uniform regulations are important because it prevents uh, oil and gas companies from having to deal with a patchwork of differing policies found in cities and counties. Now one of the ironies to this argument is that states and state officials have used precisely the same argument to rail against EPA regulatory authority for many years. And so it seems just a, a tad hypocritical for that <laughs> argument to be kind of turned on its head at the state level. The city and county folks uh, make the argument that, that, again, you raise the question here, should city and county governments be allowed to regulate fracking operations under traditional land use authority? Uh, and their answer is yes, a one-size-fits-all approach 
is inappropriate for the regulation of natural gas. And if you look at geological diversity within a state, like Colorado, it's frequently quite substantial, just like geological diversity occurs between the Mar Marcellus Shale Play in Appalachia and the Barnett Shale Play in Central Texas. Okay, and if we focus now on Colorado for a little bit, uh, a lot of the focus on natural gas, not so much fracking, but natural gas, begin with the Ritter administration. Governor Ritter, who's now the head of an energy institute at CSU, um, basically did three major things in respect to natural gas policy, very important policies. One was, uh, my view is that the first one was probably the most important. What he did was to say, um, we need to um, prevent regulatory capture from occurring on the COGCC. And to do that, we need to diversify representation on that commission. Prior to 2008, 2009, it was largely the bailiwick of oil and gas folks that had a lot of uh, experience with drilling in the field. And uh, they didn't have representation for environmental protection or wildlife or groundwater. Um, what the policy did was to expand the commission from seven to nine commissioners. It called for representation to include wildlife expert, uh, environmental protection. You have um, membership includes the head of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environmental Quality and it also includes uh, the head of the wildlife agency as well. Um, secondly, there was a separate policy that says, okay, if you have oil and gas um, development in Colorado, and one of the things that you have to consider in terms of mitigating risk is to um, consider the wildlife impacts. And so, um, Compatibility with wildlife conservation is another standalone policy that was developed under the River Administration. And thirdly, this was uh, again under the general uh, notion that uh, we, we, we have to take a, a look at climate change and um, natural gas is a bridge fuel. Well, one, within that spirit, uh, one of the things that Governor Ritter uh, accomplished in 2010 was uh, a policy, it was co-sponsored by um, Josh Ritter, I believe, um, basically saying that, um, okay, we're going to gradually phase out primarily from Excel, from coal to natural gas in terms of power plants. Okay, well, fast forward to 2011, 2012. Um, Huge discovery of the Niobrara shale play. What's different about this is that uh, all the natural gas development from 2000 to 2010 in Colorado, very important. Uh, Colorado is the sixth leading state nationally in terms of natural gas production. But a lot of that was COVID methane, okay? The Niobrara was different in the sense that uh, a lot of the shale play geographically is located along the front range from Fort Collins to Pueblo, okay? So all of a sudden you have all of these counties and cities, municipalities along the front range that have no experience with industrial activity with the possible exception of Commerce City. And um, so it's easier to find the expression of concern about environmental quality, quality of life. Where natural gas development had occurred previously was in areas, well, county, western slope. Places, uh, particularly the western slope, had a history of industrial activity. They'd had uh, lots of mining, coal, as well as uh, hard rock minerals. Uh, and so uh, for them, um, as mineral development was dwindling down uh, the Old West, they saw fracking jobs as a positive development. But along the front range, another story. 
And last year there was a, uh, a natural gas conference at CSU and one of the speakers was the mayor of Loveland. And the mayor of Loveland was, was scrambling to find information about the risks of fracking. Uh, they basically were clueless about how to proceed. Do we do a temporary moratorium? Find out enough information to develop some regulations to guide development of natural gas? Do we depose it outright? What do we do? Okay. Politically, uh, if you're looking at uh, state control, here are the pl major players. They include uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, who developed the regulations. Um, the major industry trade group, uh, which um, exercises quite a bit of political clout in Colorado, is the Colorado Oil and Gas Association, or COGA. Uh, they work very closely. Um, with COGCC on a number of areas, including the development of regulations. Governor John Hickenlooper, he's tried to actually chart kind of a middle path in some ways. Uh, one of the things that he was successful in achieving in 2011, for example, was um, developing a policy requiring uh, greater disclosure of um, chemicals and fracking fluids. Um, at that time, Colorado was one of the mo most stringent policies in the nation. Right after that, you begin to see the emergence of local opposition to fracking and fracking policies. And so he tried to preempt that. I'll get into that in a second. Other major players include the Western Energy Alliance that is um, um, active throughout the Rocky Mountain West, and key individual companies are politically active. Uh, in Kana, which is a Canadian company, uh, Williams Energy, Bill Barrett Corporation are some of the biggest. Okay, strategies. Um, in 2011, there was a major uh, conference held um, in Houston, Texas. Uh, a lot of oil companies were represented there and the basic premise of that meeting was political strategy. How do we deal with local governments? How do we stay on message? And so the message that they attempted to, in effect, um, maintain constant throughout was fracking is safe. There has never been a recorded instance of groundwater contamination associated with fracking. The economic benefits of fracking, um, OK. Secondly, uh, thirdly, industry and, and COGCC were very active in testifying before city councils to try and preempt any sort of uh, opposition to, to indicate that they were open to a collaborative solution to any problems that uh, might be foreseen by local officials. Uh, and finally, if that didn't work, if, you, if, if the soft sell didn't, didn't work, then um, the backup strategy was the hammer. And the hammer was that uh, COGC, under the state statute for oil and gas, has primary regulatory authority in Colorado. It's already been tested in the early uh, 1990s in the city of Greeley. Uh, city of Greeley argued that they had authority to, um, under land use authority, to uh, regulate natural gas. Um, Basically, the state Supreme Court held in favor of the COGCC. Okay, what about the other side, the environmentalists? Key groups here and players include, uh, of course, one of uh, Boulder's <coughs> major players, uh, Western Resource Advocates. They've done a number of good pu public policy studies dealing with setbacks, particularly in relation to schools. Uh, some very interesting policy analysis. Another group that does policy analysis quite well is Earthworks. What Earthworks have focused on, um, it's like they have a division of labor here. So uh, Western Resource Advocates is focused on the setback issue, and um, Earthworks is focused on the enforcement problems associated with oil and gas drilling in Colorado and, and throughout the country. So what Earthworks is focused on in Colorado is the disparity between the number of wells in Colorado, anybody know right off the top? 5,000? 50,000. 50,000, okay. And uh, how many inspectors do we have for 50,000? 16. 
16. I'm going to just interrupt and say you're being a little bit uh, reticent with your questions. Michaela is over there. I think the box of questions paused in the back there. So, okay, so if you could be, uh, she will be walking around and you can just pass them to her. You could pass your questions down to the center aisles. I just feel that if I have a little bit of time before, okay. uh, that would be great. So, I thank just you. ask her question as a lot of uh, no, th I appreciate that very, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's what we've been doing here. I know you came a little bit late, but if I pool the questions, I can make sure everybody is heard and everybody is attended to. So that's the system we've been following. And he will be around afterwards for one-on-one -on -one conversation. Okay. So thank you for bringing okay, that up. Okay, I'll, I'll speed up a bit. Oh, no, okay. no, please. No, no, I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure I was getting okay. questions. Well, there was actually an uh, article in the paper this morning. I don't know if you, any of you saw it in the Denver Post. Um, mm -hmm. A number of uh, bills are pending in yeah. the state legislature. Mm -hmm. You know, Gun control is over. Uh, the energy is just beginning. One of the bills actually dealt with the issue of enforcement, and uh, I don't know how far it's going to go, but uh, the bill that was proposed was uh, one that said uh, it will be public policy for every well to be inspected at least once a year. So what are the implications of that? <laughs> the implications are in the order of $7 million a year to hire an additional 70 inspectors. Right now we have 15 or 16. Yeah. Okay, uh, other folks involved in um, a greater emphasis on local authority, including uh, Colorado Counties Incorporated and Colorado Municipal Association. Okay, strategies emphasize the importance of home rule and local authority. Historically, the strongest argument for local authority has been maintaining health and education at the local level. And so that they see as being well within their purview. Uh, secondly, to lobby COGCC for uh, better enforcement of existing rules, i.e. hiring more inspectors, um, and increasing setback requirements for drilling operations. Um, even in a very pro-energy state like Texas, Many of the suburban governments around uh, Dallas, for example, have setback requirements of uh, seven, 700 feet. So they exceed those found in Colorado. Um, adoption of temporary moratoria, we've seen that in a number of communities, including Boulder. Um, adoption of policies that exceed or trump state regulatory standards, and of course the most prominent are the bans that are awaiting litigation by the cities of Fort Collins and Longmont. And finally, greater incidents of protest activities by local groups. You've seen that a uh, number of communities. Uh, Erie comes to mind. There's uh, something from last year. I kind of like this one because it represented both sides. Um, clean jobs for Ohio. Ohio is not for sale. <laughs> So, okay, recent policy developments. Okay, in early 2012, uh, Governor Hickenlooper saw that uh, state regulatory authority was being threatened by local concerns and a little bit of protest from the bottom up. So uh, he, he developed a task force through executive order. And the task force uh, set about to uh, try and make local governments feel a little bit more comfortable with fracking as a policy initiative. So that, that centered on a couple of things. One was a greater emphasis on collaboration. So COGCC was to work closely with uh, local governments to allay any concerns or fears that they had. Another major thing was to um, allow local governments to uh, do a little bit of enforcing on their own. Um, through the selection of what's called a, an LDI, a local designated inspector. Now what this was, what this amounts to is an inspector that's trained by COGCC on what to look for when inspecting a well, but they have no enforcement authority. They cannot issue a fine, they cannot uh, do any, any kind of, um, of uh, regulatory action, what they do is they bring their findings to the COGCC that is then empowered to take action. So it's basically an extra set of eyes as much as anything else. Um, as, you, as you probably know, Longmont approved a ban in, in November, uh, an election. 
despite being uh, outspent uh, $500,000 by um, energy firms, uh, they approved it by about a 65% margin. Um, litigation has already been initiated by COGA to overturn that ban. Um, COGA adopted new regulations uh, earlier this year. They included uh, preliminary testing for groundwater quality, so pre-test, post-test. Um, increased setback requirements, 500 feet. Uh, if you drill within 1,000 feet of a populated structure, like a school or a hospital or a government or, or a university, then uh, you have to get a majority of COGCC commissioners to approve it. And uh, as I already indicated, Fort Collins City Council uh, recently approved a ban. By way of contrast, Pennsylvania, um, Governor Tom Corbett, a Republican, um, campaigned on the basis of a more pro-industry fracking approach. And uh, during early in his administration, um, Act 13 was adopted. Act 13 provides us with contrast. That is by far the most strict pro-industry initiative in the U.S. It's being tested in the courts as we speak. It's before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And basically, it involves a fight between uh, municipalities, Pennsylvania Association of Municipalities, and the state government. And the state government basically said in Act 13, if any local government uh, presumes to adopt ordinance or regulations that exceed state standards, they automatically become ineligible to receive any impact funds paid in by the energy companies to defray some of the costs associated with infrastructure uh, that occur with fracking. So basically, uh, it's, it's, it's a silencing policy. Um, it was immediately challenged. Um, so far, the, the municipalities have the upper hand. They have a very strong home rule policy in Pennsylvania. And um, it's politically quite interesting. Uh, they have three Republicans and three Democrats on the Supreme Court that will be making the decision. If it's a tie vote on the Supreme Court, then that will basically uphold the circuit court decision which favored the municipalities. <coughs> So we will see what happens. There, there is actually a seventh member, but she recused herself because uh, she's under um, uh, investigation for corruption. So, what are some of the unresolved issues? Uh, one is water use. Okay, we live in a dry part of the world. Uh, Texas, in particular, has had two of the most serious drought years back-to-back -back that they've ever had, and one of the things that's occurred locally within Texas is that cities have adopted uh, ordinances that say there's a certain threshold uh, in our water supply, and if it goes below that threshold, uh, municipal use trumps fracking. Okay. In Texas, that's a big deal. Um, in, in, in Colorado, what we've seen is that energy companies have outbid uh, agricultural operations uh, for access to water, surplus water that cities currently have. If we develop oil shale in the future, that is a huge consumer of water. Uh, if fracking increases, we will also find that uh, the uh, trade-offs will become increasingly more evident. Um, secondly, uh, legislation dealing with local government land use authority to regulate the conditions and proximity of fracking. Um, I'm not sure what's going to emerge over the next couple of weeks in the state legislature, but uh, one of the ordinances that was proposed last year by three Democrats in Colorado was to increase local regulatory authority. So here's one of the ironies of federalism and political party and the interaction between the two. 
If you're looking at uh, the strategies uh, used by environmentalists, on the one hand, if you're looking to get away from state regulatory in favor of EPA, they use issue expansion as a strategy. One of the ways that they've done that, which I thought was quite innovative, was to um, use a kind of uh, toehold along the way. They knew that uh, EPA would not be accepted by Congress as um, the preferred regulatory authority for fracking. So one of the things that they've done is to increase their use of uh, interstate organizations that have some federal representation that are likely to take a suprastate approach, like the Delaware River Basin Authority. They regulate water use in four states in the Northeast, and one of the things that they've done is to develop fracking regulations that protect water to some extent. So that's an approach. Uh, finally, uh, we haven't seen, my guess is that uh, the Colorado Supreme Court will probably uphold the state statute that uh, basically says the state law trumps local land use authority. However, there is a Colorado Land Use Act of 1974, so it's not, it's not a lot necessarily, but if I were a betting person, I would probably say that uh, they'll probably uphold state regulatory authority on this. So, uh, questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for those who may have come in late, our, our format, I, first of all, I would like to remind everyone here that the National Science Foundation project that we are undertaking, we are evaluated for our neutrality. So I shall be attempting to get a favorable evaluation for my performance as a moderator. Uh, I also, or at least a neutral one, I guess that would be what I would want uh, for an evaluation. We also have, as you pointed out, many smart people in this room, and if I do this, I can get us through the questions and it... At a certain point, people start thinking about dinner. Let's be frank about that, that there's a moment of people doing that. So that is why we have this format where I will be asking you okay. questions. So I would like to start off on something that I think is in a number of people's minds here. Oh, thank you. Uh, which is on the question of how, if media leading the conversation, uh, the, and you're mentioning the politics influencing the public information when a spill occurs and the proportion or disproportion of that, how can the public insist on accurate, timely reporting when this industry dwells in, well, in non-disclosed operations? Well, partly there's an explosion. In, uh, on the one hand, I don't really know the answer to that question, but on the other hand, uh, we have an explosion of information sources that include social media and the internet, and many of the local groups that have been effective um, in Longmont, in Boulder, in Fort Collins, have been uh, very good at, at exploiting uh, the advantages mm -hmm. of social media. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's kind of a check and balance mm -hmm. against uh, a medium, media source that hasn't been, um, you know, has been overly concerned about advertising revenue. Many years ago, I used to teach uh, at the University of Wyoming, and uh, there was a, a policy issue in Laramie about uh, a Superfund site within the city, within the town. So the Laramie Boomerang, which was the town newspaper, uh, basically revealed no information whatsoever about the cement plant in town that was um, the alleged Superfund site. It actually was, so it wasn't really alleged. But uh, what was kind of funny was that a lot of people in Laramie uh, also read the state newspaper from Casper, the Casper Star Tribune. And Casper loved to exploit um, the Laramie Boomerang's unwillingness <laughs> to report the news. So they had lots of headlines about Superfund in Laramie. Oh, and really, this, I, this may have the bigger picture of, is there something that should be happening in political decision making or policy to address this major problem, uh, same point in some ways, is confidentiality of, indus confidentiality of industry on lawsuits, chemical data, monitoring data. Is this changing? If not, how can it be changed and would there be a political route to that change? I think it's going to be very difficult to overcome because uh, industrial trade secrets have been uh, a very effective strategy by industry 
to uh, avoid disclosure. Now, the one thing that might help in terms of providing a little more sunshine as far as proposed regulations or strengthening these uh, disclosure policies is uh, what's happening in Pennsylvania that I mentioned a little bit earlier. And that is, if you have um, the gradual increase in public health studies that suggest that there are additional risks associated with respiratory problems, with um, a variety of, of health-related issues um, that affect decision-making in states like New York, and New York is looking at this very closely, then uh, I can imagine that uh, maybe the industrial trade secrets argument might not <coughs> seem quite as strong when you're making the trade-offs. Uh, and I do have a couple of, of questions about um, the, the disclosure, but I think, well, actually, let's just see if there's anything this, <clears throat> thank you, that you would like to add to this topic. Didn't the Halliburton loophole, which was approved by many Democrats, including Senator Barack Obama, uh, well, okay, if that was approved by Democrats, then what is the legacy of that? If there were Democrats who must have been, must have signed on to that, what does that do to political alignments and partisanship? Uh, and then also connected to that, could you explain why hydraulic fracturing was exempted from the underground injection program of the Safe Drinking Water Act? Is that because fracking did not meet the definition of underground injection? So those are not exactly. <laughs> well, they both are about okay. something about federal regulation. So put them well, together. I don't know what the party vote on that specific uh, loophole amendment was, but uh, uh, part of the Democratic support for the Larger Energy Act of 2005, of which the Halliburton loophole was a part, was based on the fact that there had been a series of compromises from a bill that in the early 2000s was largely fossil fuels and a few crumbs for renewables to one that did provide the, the, um, the renewable energy credit for solar and for wind and uh, more research and development money for renewables than the original bill. So they saw that under the Bush administration this was probably the best bill that they could probably get. And so um, my guess is that it wasn't so much uh, up, up or down for the Halliburton loophole. Um, in 2005, remember, fracking wasn't as big an issue as it was in 2009. So um, I think that uh, many Democrats uh, voted for the bill in terms of its overall merits rather than fracking per se. And then there was the item, uh, if there's anything you want to add on the uh, underground injection. Oh. Please explain why hydraulic fraction was exempted from the underground injection program of the Safe Drinking Water Actors. That just... I guess maybe I have a different did. understanding. Uh, I, I thought that EPA retained uh, regulatory authority under uh, underground injection, but that they have largely delegated that part of the Clean Safe Drinking Water Act to the states. And so uh, they've been very reluctant to superimpose uh, their regulatory authority, preempt state authority under the partial preemption doctrine that they use. Okay, we're moving into a category now, which are things that people would like a little more clarification, okay. uh, if you would like to, if these, these may be for other speakers, but what are the differences in implication of fracking for gas versus fracking for oil? Um, I would guess that at the moment it's largely um, cost and profit. Um, oil is uh, much more profitable these days for energy companies than gas. Gas is um, sort of marginally profitable for many companies these days because um, it's, it's, it's very cheap. Um, oil, on the other hand, as well as some of the liquid forms of natural gas uh, are, are extremely profitable for companies, and that's why they're so excited about some of the uh, forthcoming shale plays. The forthcoming shale play that uh, has industry uh, really excited is um, the shale play in California, which is uh, supposed to dwarf the Marcellus shale play uh, once they get around to it. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, state royalties from fracking, what benefit to state revenues come from this use of natural resources and the reduction and depletion of that natural resource? Okay, uh, there's two ways that uh, states get revenues. One is from public lands. Um, public lands under the Mineral Leasing Act of, of 1920, which uh, includes uh, natural gas as well as coal and oil, um, basically uh, sets a royalty rate. I believe it's 12 and a half percent. Um, and so that, that is shared. Uh, another is severance taxes. Now severance taxes operate differently in different states. In Colorado, the state doesn't really benefit that much from severance taxes. Severance taxes basically in Colorado um, are largely allocated to local governments to deal with impacts. Kind of like they are in Pennsylvania at the moment. So um, other states have uh, a larger severance tax uh, in terms of percentage and they also provide the lion's share of the money to state government rather than local government. At the moment, they're having a big fat fight in, in Ohio because the Republican governor of Ohio um, is angling for a severance tax rate of about 7.5% that's comparable to nearby states like uh, West Virginia that would provide enough revenue for the state to fund a lot of the environmental protection concerns. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, there's a fight within the Republican Party uh, um, that includes a number of other statewide elected officials, such as the uh, Attorney General, that uh, are more of a Tea Party persuasion. So they see this as a violation of tax pledges <coughs> to favor a, a severance tax. So. Uh -huh. What is the role of subsidies to oil and gas as they relate to fracking? Uh, this is the part Reagan said was like the quiz show where I just didn't Okay. So. Well, I, I'm aware of subsidies that are used for oil and gas exploration and oil and gas generally speaking, but for fracking per se, um, I'm not really... I think the biggest subsidy was probably a political one, and that was the exemption from the Safe Drinking well, Water Act. Yeah. Uh, what were the limitations imposed by Governor Ritter that limited coal and encouraged the use of natural gas? Oh, that was, a, that was the law that was passed in 2010 with some support uh, from Republicans that basically argued that air quality concerns would be greatly enhanced by a policy that uh, called for the gradual conversion of power plants um, now powered by coal to natural gas uh, within a given period of time. And Exhibit A was Excel. I think that's the major company that was affected by that particular policy. And they have actually made progress in, in uh, doing that. Uh, two related, two on uh, split estate and property rights and I think they're close enough, I'll just put them together here. Discuss the negotiation adjudication process for surface property rights versus mineral rights, and right next to that, where mineral rights and surface rights belong to two different entities, are there current bills or initiatives to give more rights to the surface owner while not disallowing the owner of mineral rights to develop their minerals? I will be honest, uh, split estate uh, law on mineral rights and gas is something that I believe the energy lawyers can be uh, addressed much more knowledgeably than I. Uh, it's a very complex area of law. There are uh, lawsuits and uh, legal uh, concerns in the Pennsylvania courts right now that get into uh, really uh, sticky questions like uh, uh, the laws that were written in the 1800s uh, that dealt with property rights, dealt with um, finite sources like coal, uh, whereas natural gas is uh, sometimes semi-solid or liquid or oil, and so um, they've discovered that the law doesn't necessarily affect all minerals in the same way, and they haven't figured out a policy solution for that legal problem. So they're fighting it out in the courts at the moment, 
but the implication is that they need to find some kind of a policy solution for that. Uh, and then to bring in the issue of another form of local government, or not local government, but sovereignty in federalism, uh, is there something to say about the impacts of gas and oil development on Indian reservations and the politics involved there that might be illuminating in this bigger picture of federalism? Okay. Well, at the moment, um, the, nation, the, the notion of, of tribal concerns on fracking um, pertain to the Indian Self-Determination Act of 1978. In other areas of environmental policy, what you see is like pesticides, for example. Um, tribal governments are like states. They're equivalent in the sense that they can be granted regulatory authority to manage pesticide federal pesticide programs uh, on their own land. Um, it's delegated by EPA once EPA is, is persuaded that the tribal authorities have the um, economic, uh, technological, and organizational wherewithal to manage these programs. But with respect to fracking and oil and gas, they don't have that. BLM has the authority. Mm -hmm. So right now, one of the, the, the key sticking points to the formulation of a new rule for EPA's, or for BLM's regulatory authority for fracking, they, they've had a, a regulatory, a regulation for fracking, but it's 30 years old. So it, it predates the marriage of fracking with uh, horizontal drilling, for example. So it's time to, to update that regulation, and they're doing it. Uh, but one of the things that, that hasn't been answered to the satisfaction of many tribal groups is um, whether or not tribal folks will get more autonomy from, EP, from BLM to manage um, energy development concerns. Right now, um, they're largely subservient to BLM in terms of making those kinds of decisions. Uh, one item that you mentioned that stuck in a uh, person's mind here, regulating gas recapture on gas wells seems like a win-win situation, better for the environment and potentially economically favorable. Is this controversial? Why is this controversial? Because it's uh, competing economics. Um, uh, EPA argues that uh, if they do this uh, in good faith, that um, the amount of money that they could save by um, using and selling methane that ordinarily might escape from uh, compressors or from pipelines uh, would pay for the additional cost of the technology or whatever means that the companies use to recapture um, that gas that is currently escaping. The companies, uh, the American Petroleum Institute argues that um, the cost to the companies is um, over 20 times what EPA <coughs> says it is. So it's partly, it's mostly politics, but under the umbrella of economics. Uh, I now have sort of a federal, state, and local okay. progression we'll be making here. And we'll start with a couple of questions about the EPA study you mentioned. First, when will that EPA study be completed? Well, the expected date is 2014. Um, they were supposed to, they, they came up out with a uh, preliminary look in 2012, which didn't tell us very much. The one thing that it did tell us was that um, there had been some concessions to industry as far as um, uh, disclosure policies, um, and that um, by and large, frack focus uh, was something that, that um, the feds were more willing to consider. Um, but beyond that, uh, the other thing, the major, the other major concession that they made was to, ex they were supposed to do uh, case studies of about uh, four or five um, communities throughout the United States that would augment uh, some of the more quantitative parts of their research design. Uh, these are communities um, that some of which were, were focused in gas land and other documentaries as being communities that were adversely affected uh, groundwater wise by fracking. And so 
one of the things that EPA did was to uh, drop one of the communities in Louisiana, which was in the Haynesville Shale Play, which is one of the larger ones, for reasons unknown. <laughs> so, so again, the study is supposed to be completed in, in 2014. Whether or not that leads to additional <coughs> regulatory authority remains to be seen. But a lot of the politics of the study revolves around representation of who's participating on the study. Uh, early on, uh, one of the things that the Obama folks did was to include a lot of professors from universities. Uh, many of the Republicans objected, arguing that industry representation was being shortchanged. And so that was the early political skirmish that occurred on the EPA study. Um, it remains to be seen what's going to happen in 2014. If there are other questions, we could have one more circulation here of acquiring questions if there are more here. I'm in such good state mastery here, I'm ready to take on more. Uh, one more EPA study question. Doesn't the current EPA study fall short in some areas, and this person specifies runoff effects on aquatic ecosystems that are not being addressed? That's a level of detail that I don't have yeah, that's in my head. Yeah. Uh, and then on a, on a bigger, uh, much more macro scale, uh, Sally Jewell looks like she will be the next Interior Secretary. She's got a foot in both camps uh, as a petroleum engineer and then as her recreational outdoors activities. How will she impact the debate, do you think? She's been very circumspect so far, yeah, so which is politically yeah. <laughs> very right. wise for her to do. Um, but one of the things that uh, is a, it seems to me, is a carryover from uh, Salazar's um, tour of duty is that uh, she's trying to maintain this balancing act and uh, a search for the center as far as uh, balancing the, the economic uses of public lands. Now, one of the things that she's likely to do much more forcefully is to, you know, given her background, is to, of course, emphasize the recreational benefits of public lands as an economic driver just as much as energy is an economic driver. Um, it's the economics of drilling for natural gas on public lands I think is, is likely to become even more controversial. Right now there are controversies in, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, uh, in Paonia. Uh, there, was, uh, there were a number of leasing decisions made by BLM in Colorado recently, and 20% uh, of the original acreage was subsequently withdrawn because of pressure uh, ex uh, basically made by a number of environmentalists and farmers in Paonia and uh, areas that are close to Dinosaur National Monument and in southwestern Colorado. Uh, because of concerns that uh, drilling activity was occurring too close to organic farms, to um, uh, recreational areas, BLM listened. Now, there's a similar conversation that's going on in California right now. And uh, the uh, Monterey Shale Play uh, actually is located in an area that includes a lot of wineries. A lot of uh, areas that um, environmentalists absolutely treasure and covet in California. And one of the issues is the same in both California and, and in Colorado. And that is that uh, BLM has always been an agency that has been underfunded. They have management plans that are over a decade old. The management plan in Colorado um, that BLM used to make decisions on leases for the Paonia area was completed in 1989. It's fair to say, and, and I think they listened to the environmentalists on this, that uh, there hasn't been any kind of environmental analysis in the form of impact statements that have considered uh, the kinds of land use changes and lifestyle changes that have occurred since 1989 in Paonia and in parts of western Colorado, North Fork is another, you know, North Fork Valley, that um, have been taken into account. By, and, and so the message is 
that we need more environmental analysis about impacts before we get into the question of making leasing decisions for oil and gas. Uh, a couple of questions now I'm shifting to state inspection uh, and funding going from BLM being uh, underfunded to uh, given the, the really short supply of inspectors in the state mm -hmm. of Colorado, has it been proposed that companies contribute to paying for an increase in, ex in inspections? Inspectors, rather, inspectors? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen the particulars of that bill that was uh, discussed very briefly in, um, the color in, in the Denver Post today. But uh, my guess is that uh, there would be some kind of a fee imposed upon uh, energy operations that would ensure that Colorado taxpayers are not saddled with the additional cost of inspecting uh, these companies. What its chances are in the state legislature, uh, I can't really say. Uh, you had mentioned that there was, that the industry claims there has been no groundwater contamination. Is that in some ways a product of the uh, difficulty of getting inspectors out there? That is, how many investigations has the state undertaken? And might it be that the low level of reporting of groundwater contamination connects to the scarcity of inspectors? There are a number of uh, research stories that the publication ProPublica uh, put out in the last few years. One of those was uh, focusing on Colorado, and, and one of the major areas of concern was uh, Garfield County. And uh, this, the, I believe the School of, of Public Health at CU uh, did participate in a study that looked at uh, some of the groundwater risks associated with Garfield County. Um, there was also, uh, you know, there's a disagreement about uh, prospective contamination in uh, Wyoming, which was a subject of uh, Frackland, and that's a, a small town in the southwestern Wyoming. Uh, coal bed methane, uh, groundwater contamination, both documentaries mentioned it quite a bit. Um, EPA has concluded in a couple of studies that uh, groundwater contamination could be attributed to drilling operations. Incana and other energy companies realize that uh, once you uh, uh, basically agree that uh, it's possible for groundwater to contamination to occur, that it makes it very difficult to control the message. So uh, they argue that the methodology is flawed and that uh, uh, more study needs to be done before <laughs> conclusions can be reached. Uh, now we are on a local place-based <coughs> thing about the uh, setbacks, really. Uh, first of all, this comment begins. I should pass this on. Thank you very much. The comment begins. So let's begin with that. Thank you very much. I would like your opinion on possible proximity of, of leakage near homes and residential communities and near well site heads, the, uh, the likelihood of that, but then very connected to that. With horizontal drilling technology, why is it difficult to locate wells further from homes and schools? Because so, of cost. Oh, cost. The energy companies basically argue that it's a, a lot more expensive to um, um, go horizontally for long distances. They also argue that, uh, uh, and this is uh, a strategic argument on their behalf, is that uh, um, it's unfair to existing open spaces and farmers and landowners to bear the brunt of those setback decisions. And so that if you're making a decision that neighborhoods should uh, have a higher comfort level because of increased setback decisions, this in turn shifts the burden to um, folks that live on the outskirts of the city, including ranchers. Well, and that's uh, a very fine transition to this next question, which you had also brought up, the comparison with Garfield County. It appears that attention is paid to effects of natural gas development uh, as it becomes more prominent, as it, appro and it becomes more prominent as it approaches greater population centers. 
Can you discuss how political capital plays in this discussion? And can you then contrast situations here with, the, with efforts on the Western Slope, uh, Garfield County and La Plata County? Okay. Um, I did a, a paper a few months ago that um, looked at state-local relationships and um, local protests and local concerns about fracking. And uh, I looked at uh, the various cities and counties that had enacted temporary moratoria, that uh, bans, and other activities that uh, really appeared to exceed uh, COGC uh, regulations in terms of their stringency. So uh, I wanted to find out, well, what are the characteristics of these? Um, the first thing that came to mind was um, political party, which is an incredibly important variable in terms of individual attitudes, in terms of uh, policy actors, and so forth. But with respect to community response, um, I discovered that it really wasn't that important. That uh, if you look at uh, communities uh, south of Denver, Colorado Springs, Albert County, they've had uh, substantial opposition in those communities as well. These are, are folks, the, these are counties that uh, voted 65% uh, plus for Romney mm -hmm. in the last election. So it wasn't party per se. Uh, the one, I also looked at uh, socioeconomic characteristics. Um, they didn't tell me a whole lot in terms of uh, differentiating among the counties and municipalities. But one thing that did was the sheer number of drilling operations within city limits. So there are two communities that kind of stick out. One is Erie, one is Windsor. Both are about 20,000 people. Both have over 200 wells operating within city limits. That gets people's attention. <laughs> You know, it's, it's kind of funny. I mean, it, it's something that you can get used to if you live uh, close to industrial activity um, over a long period of time. Uh, the, in the West Slope, uh, again, because they, they are mining communities and ranching communities, they live off of extractive industries to a considerable extent. Uh, they're used to it, but they're not used to industrial activity along the Front Range. Um, Again, Greeley, Weld County is an exception. That's an area of um, oil and gas activity that goes back a long ways. Anti-fracking activists often claim that local decisions should prevail. Do uh, those activists believe this consistent, consistently or only when the city is more anti-fracking than the state or feds? What is the philosophy of such activists on local versus state supremacy uh, on the substance of some other issues, that is, would they feel that way about gun rights or about abortion or about other things like, like that? Do they prefer the state stance or the feds just in relationship to the particular topic? Uh, it varies dramatically according to the issue. I don't think there's any ideological consistency whatsoever. Uh, as somebody who teaches state and local government, um, I was kind of amused um, a couple of days ago that... Uh, the state of Mississippi decided to preempt local authority. I don't know how many of you saw this, um, but uh, it was um, dealing with uh, Mayor Bloomberg in New York oh, City yes, yeah. decision to um, deal with obesity as a political issue. And so this was just too good to pass up for the Mississippi legislature. They decided, they called it the anti-Bloomberg bill. <laughs> Basically, uh, the, the text of the bill says that uh, local governments in the state of Mississippi are not allowed, are not permitted to adopt any ordinance that uh, places restrictions uh, on what people eat or drink or consume. So, you know, the, uh, the target was, of course, uh, the supersized, you know, drinks that uh, contribute lots of calories and and, of course, one of the ironies that many of the, the people, even the supporters, pointed out was that Mississippi, uh, statistically, is the most obese state in the country. <laughs> they are, they're standing by their principles there, aren't they? That's exactly, uh, or sitting with their principles, maybe more than that. So, 
That was a neutral statement. That was just me <laughs> making fun of Mississippi. Where you stand depends on where you sit. <laughs> right. Okay, here, uh, Boulder County has 220,000 vehicles burning millions of gallons of fossil fuels a year. Boulder County has 110,000 residences using billions of cubic feet of gas to heat. Given this uh, prodigious, excuse me, I thought it said passionate, but it says prodigious. Uh, prodigious consumption is a fracking bin, a very def refined example of nimbyism. Um, that's kind of a philosophical stretch. I mean, it does get to the point about um, uh, greater concerns about energy consumption and uh, being philosophically consistent. And uh, I think the author of that question is probably correct in assuming that uh, uh, there are larger lifestyle issues such as the size of the house, the amount of uh, energy required to heat that house, the kind of vehicle that we drive that uh, ultimately enter into the larger uh, energy mix. The counterpoint would be that uh, uh, warts and all that natural gas is still preferable to coal and that the U.S. in comparison to other countries uh, has made much greater progress in terms of emitting fewer greenhouse gases in comparison to other countries, largely because of cheap gas that's been made available by fracking operations. So, uh, A later rival that takes us back to the setback thing, but I do want to make sure all the questions get addressed. Doesn't the reluctance of operators to meet particular setbacks have more to do with where they have leases than it does the expense of horizontal drilling? Um, I would venture a guess, and I would probably say yes, but um, I don't have evidence to back it up one way or the other. Okay. Uh, please comment on the suit against Longmont. I think that uh, the suit against Longmont uh, by Koga, and uh, I'm not sure if um, COGCC has formally come on board yet or whether they're going to let Koga do the heavy lifting, I guess, is the latter, because I think uh, Governor Hickenlooper feels a certain amount of discomfort with um, conveying any impression that the state is coming down hard on, on local rights. Um, even though he, he clearly favors a statewide policy on fracking. Um, but, um, so. Okay, um, just a last few here. Uh, from an industry perspective, is there a sweet spot for regulatory control, federal, state, or local? Or does it just depend on local and how much the locals accept or reject natural gas drilling and production? What is the industry strategy for optimal Regu regulatory management for their interests. Okay, that one's easy. Um, that's a statewide regulatory approach. Uh, it served them well. Um, statistically, um, state oil and gas conservation commissions um, are strongly pro-development in terms of their policy decisions. And uh, they have a certain comfort level in terms of having dealt with these commissions for a very long period of time. Okay, uh, in regard to regulatory strategies, so I think this is a, who would monitor the means and outcomes? Is there someone positioned, is it uh, professors, who is it that looks at regulatory strategies and policies and says that's working well, that's not working well? Is there someone positioned to monitor the means and outcomes of policies? Right now, there, there hasn't been a lot of research. Part of it is because the data is extremely hard to get. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, chemical disclosure policies, for example, and frac focus, uh, the principal argument that's been uh, waged against um, frac focus, which is, again, sponsored largely by the American Petroleum Institute, um, and it's, a, it's been a, a PR gain for these folks because it allows them to argue that um, um, they're being transparent and they're, they're trying to provide uh, optimum information um, subject, of course, to industrial trade secrets. Um, but um, the problem is that if you want to do comparative studies, 
uh, the information is not downloadable in a research friendly way. Uh, you can, with great effort, find information that's particular to a particular state. But if you wanted to compare the 33 states that have, um, you know, uh, some amount of fracking going on in terms of uh, uh, a comparative analysis of what characteristics of states mm -hmm. are associated with higher levels of enforcement, uh, you can't get that data right now. Um, it, even if you use the Freedom of Information Act, you can't get that data. <laughs> it's very hard to obtain. So what we do have is a couple of um, uh, organizations, nonprofits, uh, like Earthworks in particular, that have done some preliminary work on enforcement, focusing on some of the larger producer states, like Texas and Colorado and Pennsylvania. And they've come up with some fairly interesting studies. Uh, here's a we're going out with a couple of big picture things, and this is of thinking, I guess going back to Major Powell, mostly Powell, Good is it that our jurisdictions are all uh, oddly drawn and not particularly sensible or useful? Should we have, should there be basin, a basin uh, shaped jurisdiction? Should we, are we, all these damn squares, is that our, pro that's I'm paraphrasing from the person, but is there just something, <laughs> something wrong with our jurisdictional structure, which having studied this for so many years, would you just think, you mean well, like Section 3 and Section 15? That's a problem, BLM. isn't it? Yeah. That. <laughs> uh, I think uh, many people would argue that a regional strategy makes a lot of sense for natural resource decisions. And people at CU and other places, including U.S. Geological Survey in Fort Collins, have looked at the Colorado Plateau. And uh, they've looked at uh, uh, some regional uh, decision-making experiments uh, in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. Um, some interesting uh, preliminary results from that. but getting that uh, enshrined in public policy would be inordinately difficult. I think that's uh, And then the last question I thought we would go out on this is about uh, big concepts, responsibility, blame, what to do when there are injuries. Uh, is it productive to blame the regulators, to blame energy industries? Is there, is there a framework for taking these highly charged concepts of injuries and blame and responsibility and making the discussion more productive or, or better based rather than just we'll blame these guys, we'll blame these other guys. Is there, is there a bigger framework for thinking about responsibility? And that, I guess, gets back a little bit maybe to the thing about our own resource use and, and so on. So oh, well, you're a political scientist for him's sake. So just whatever yeah. big thoughts you might have there. <laughs> Big thoughts, are, <coughs> excuse me, are more the, the, the province of political theorists, huh. the good state. You're doing data. Right than, <laughs> my stuff is public policy. Uh -huh. You know, I looked at uh, what's politically feasible uh, within the context of um, our revenue stream, uh, uh, political values, and uh, what's technologically feasible. Uh -huh. One of the things that seems kind of encouraging is that, um, you know, I, I do think that. Um, if there could be more discussion about regulatory innovation in ways that could encourage uh, technological innovation and improvement. For example, we know that uh, Halliburton and a few other companies have experimented with um, fracking operations that use substantially less water. Don't, and if they do uh, use uh, water that is not drinkable. Um, the state of Pennsylvania has experimented with uh, policies, they're at least discussing policies, that would use acid mine drainage as a fracking fluid. But what's stalled after initial enthusiasm was concerns about liability. So, so there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done, uh, public policy-wise. But I think it's a, it's, a, it's a discussion that ought to be taken, and I think to some extent research centers and public policy centers could probably contribute to that. Well, this has really been very valuable for us, and thank you so much for taking spring break. Here.